Okay, let's pick up where we left off. We were on chapter three and four, finishing our uh, chapters one to four um, study. The third chapter is titled Gotama. And as you can expect, this is when our main characters, Siddhartha and Govinda, actually meet the Buddha and um, hear his teaching for the first time. Um, so what I want to point out to you in this chapter, um, they see him uh, at the bottom of page 25. Remember, I'm still using this version of the book to follow the page numbers. Uh, they go into this village where they hear that he is. They see monks that look like they could be Buddhist followers. They come to this woman who they see these monks going to her house to get food. And she says to them, because they asked her, have you seen the Buddha? And she says, I have seen him many times, the sublime one. I have seen him on many days as he silently walked through the streets in a yellow cloak, silently held out his alms bowls in the front doors and carried away his filled bowl. They listen ecstatically. They're so happy. They're just like, oh my God, we made it. We we're going to find him. We're going to learn from him. We cannot wait. Now, I want you to also think about the repetition of this idea that every time we see the Buddha, he's soundless. He's silent. Remember, we spoke about simplicity and asceticism and the most simple sound being none, right? Or that om, that om that they're uh, we're talking about in chapter one. So we have this repetition of two things in, in the third chapter. Gotama's soundlessness, his silence, and also this yellow cloaks, right? And in the first day when I was introducing these terms and these definitions that you need to understand, the yellow cloak um, was how the Buddha told the monks to wear hues that were from tree barks, from leaves, you know, to dye their cloths according to earthly tones. So these yellow cloaks are essentially a symbol of uh, self-abnegation, which is the denial of oneself, the denial of one's desires, okay? So the two samanas accustomed to living in the forest quickly and soundlessly found a refuge and rested there until morning. Okay, so they find him, they see him, uh, they're, they're, they're going to meet him, they see the monks in the yellow cloaks. We have a little bit of an afro again, the shady gardens. Now, Buddha is light. He's the light, okay? Imagine they're calling him the illuminated one, the enlightened one. So when we were talking about the symbolism of light and darkness, Buddha himself is a symbol of light because he is the symbol of enlightenment. He is the visual representation, the literal representation or actualization of what nirvana supposedly looks like while still being alive. And as I mentioned to you guys in the very first day of class when I taught you Plato's allegory of the cave, uh, for uh, a way that I would paraphrase what enlightenment means is it's when you learn something that is so changing to your entire perception of what you previously believed to be true, capital T, R-U-E, as in the one and absolute truth of existence, of the world, of the universe, that you look upon everything in your world differently, as if you had different eyes. Uh, you know, the, the phrase that they have, like, you, well, you're wearing rosy colored glasses. That's kind of like a phrase that we use to say, well, you see things the way you want to see them, right? You're putting a filter on your, 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 uh, your ability to perceive things, and you want to see things the way you see them with rose colored glasses. Well, enlightenment is imagine, uh, I'm thinking of a million references for this in literature, right? Like even in scripture where the scales fall off your eyes or when someone says, I see, I've seen the light. Right? It's a basically like saying, I've seen the truth. And so enlightenment is when you reach some kind of knowledge or you learn something that is so devastating in a good way. And it breaks apart so many illusions that you've had in your life that you now see everything about your life with that new perception and that new cause and that new foundation and the new everything. So that's what the Buddha has essentially reached, the sense of enlightenment. Um, we're in the shady gardens. Uh, the monks, the, the monks are there with these alms bowls to gather food for lunch, um, and the only meal of the day. And Buddha himself, the illuminated one, would also go begging in the morning. Siddhartha saw him, and he instantly recognized him as if a god had pointed him out. So, of all of the monks, of all of the men who are going around with the alms bowls and receiving uh, food from people, he sees the Buddha, and he knows he's like, "That's the one. That's that's the guy who's reached enlightenment." Siddhartha saw him, instantly recognized him as if God had pointed him out. He saw him, a simple man in a yellow cowl, the alms bowl in his hand, as he silently walked. And then Govinda, 
peered at the monk in the yellow cowl, and nothing seemed to set him apart from the hundreds of other monks. And yet, next sentence, Govinda soon realized this is he. That's him. That's the one, right? Top of page 27, we have the visual, physical description of the Buddha. His silent face, calm, silent, hidden smile, his silently lowered gaze, his silently hanging arm, his every last finger on his silently hanging hand spoke of perfection, did not seek, did not imitate, breathed gently in an everlasting calm, in an everlasting light, in inviolable peace. So just like this, this aura of peace about him, of almost stillness, right? The silence is kind of representing a stillness maybe of, of, of his soul, of his, of his self, right? Uh, middle of 27, thus Gautama walked toward the town to gather alms. Tusamanas recognized him solely by the perfection of his calm silence of his figure in which no seeking, no wanting, no imitating, no striving were to be recognized, but only light and peace. Again, this visual representation of illumination of enlightenment. And Govinda says, oh, today we will hear the Siddhar, you know, the Buddha's teachings and Siddhartha does not respond. Now we see our protagonist is kind of like we said, he's a quick study. We see this kind of foreshadowing that his father has already looked upon Siddhartha as kind of um, this destiny to make it because he's followed his father's footsteps for so long and um, he becomes better than the father, right? He's searching for something more. Then we see him with the Samanas and he's able to best even the elder Samana. So when we see Siddhartha start to emulate the qualities of the Buddha, first in the silence, just like in uh, when he was bewitching the old Samana, he was using his physical body and the power of his will and his eyes to... Um, to impart his feelings, his emotions, his will, his thought uh, into the Samana and the Samana was paralyzed. Uh, when we see our protagonist kind of learning everything quickly, we, we kind of see what's gonna happen here, right? We kind of see the end game. We already can see the last chapter. We, we hope Siddhartha reaches enlightenment, don't we? Um, so um, Siddhartha did not respond and Interesting, right? We already see Siddhartha has already explicitly said, I don't know what we can learn from teachers. I don't even know if I want to be taught anything anymore. But I'm going to go and I'm going to give this guy Buddha a shot. The second sentence in that paragraph, he writes, he writes, he was not very curious about the teaching. He did not believe it could teach him anything new. After all, just like Govinda, he had heard the contents of the Buddha's teaching over and over. Maybe from second and third hand accounts, but his teaching. But he peered attentively at Gautama's head his shoulders, his feet, his silently hanging hand, and it seemed as if every joint of every finger of this hand contained a teaching. This reminds me so much of when I teach Shinsu's Encouraging Learning, and Shinsu is spelled H-S-U-N, last name T-Z-U. Shinsu's Encouraging Learning is an essay I teach uh, in front of one of my colleges for one of my uh, freshman year writing courses. And he talks about the idea of a gentleman and the idea of education. He says, learning should never cease. Achievement consists of never giving up. And he says that when a wise man, a gentleman, takes in a learning, it manifests in his body. Every gesture of that man, of that gentleman, is a physical representation of what that man knows and who that man is. And so he, in, Sh in Shinsu's Encouraging Learning, he talks about the wisdom going in the ear, manifesting in the brain, traveling to all the four limbs, making the man stand differently, look differently, have just like a different sense of things because his learning, what he knows, is part of him now, right? The difference between knowledge and wisdom, knowledge is passive. There's a lot of smart people who read a lot of books, know a lot of things. But wisdom is active knowledge. That which I have learned has now changed how I live. It changes the very core of who I am. It affects every decision I now make. It, uh, it alters every movement of my body. I am no longer just a knower. I am what I know. I live what I know, right? And when we seek out mentors and we seek out leaders, especially spiritual leaders, we look for this kind of opposite of hypocrisy. We look for this authenticity right? Of that person is what he says he is in every manifestation of himself. Is he that? This is what we see in the physical representation of Buddha in this page. This hand, this Buddha, 
was uh, this man I'm sorry this Buddha was full of truth capital T remember the platonic ideals remember the platonic ideals right all of the capital letters beauty truth patience justice love soul God was full of truth down to the gesture of his very last finger this man was holy never had Siddhartha venerated a human being so deeply never had he loved a human being so deeply as this one and this is the first time we hear the word love in this book this is the first time we have any reference to it we know about doting we know about pride in this book we see the way that the father and the mother look at Siddhartha um, joy leaps in their hearts bliss leaps in them but we not we didn't hear about love we just heard about the way that they appear the way he appears to them and the way that they accept him uncritically they love to look at him obviously the implication of love is there the parental love but the first uh, uh, indication of this word L-O-V-E in the text here as he looks at Buddha and he says he loves him so let's turn to page 28 then they heard his voice they heard his voice and it too was perfect was perfectly calm was full of peace and um Gotama taught the teaching of suffering the origin of suffering the path to the elimination of suffering this is the four noble truths this is the eightfold path right I'm just gonna update my notes with that because this is what I went over with you when I was describing what Hindus believe and what Hinduism is in essence right suffering was life the world was full of suffering but deliverance from suffering had been found deliverance was found by taking the path of the Buddha and then again just some symbolic references to form down the middle of 28 where the Hesse writes with repetitions bright and still his voice hovered over the listeners like a light like a starry sky and this is referencing how Buddha spoke and how people listen going down to the bottom of 28 low again again the way that word oh, that word low means lo means behold or look now Govinda also stepped forward the shy youth and said I too take refuge with the sublime one and his teaching so after Buddha teaches it's almost like he gives a little lecture and then afterwards these monks these new monks that that showed up to teach with him this is their first night or the first evening with him they devote themselves to him they say we want to be sheltered by your teaching please accept us please let us be part of this group please let us learn from you and so Govinda too and for once we see him making a move on his own and this is not going unnoticed by Siddhartha Govinda stepped forward and he is described as the shy youth remember he is the one who's always in Siddhartha's shadow he always follows Siddhartha now Govinda comes out first so we see our first little character arc in Govinda which is excellent I too take refuge with the sublime one and his teaching and then Siddhartha upon hearing Govinda's words page 29 awoke as if from a dream because Siddhartha is saying I'm sorry Govinda tells Siddhartha like aren't you gonna uh like join us too like don't you want to like we just came all of this way we spent all of these years with the Samanas we heard about this guy we came to this guy he's obviously the one don't you want to stay with the teaching he gazed and gazed into Govinda's face Siddhartha then he murmured in a voice without mockery Govinda my friend you have taken the step you have chosen the path you have always oh Govinda been my friend you have always walked a step behind me I have often wondered will Govinda ever take a step alone without me prompted by his own soul look now you have become a man and are choosing your own path may you walk it to its end oh my friend may you find deliverance this idea of becoming a man is going to show up in the next chapter when Siddhartha feels like he's become a man so he he praises Govinda and says wow you're growing you're changing everything in this life is actually changing you right wisdom you're taking it in you're changing you've become a man Govinda really doesn't understand to what Siddhartha is saying because he cannot imagine that he's going to be separated from Siddhartha but Siddhartha places his hand on Govinda's shoulder remember on page 11 the way the father blessed Siddhartha Siddhartha is now using that same gesture to bless Govinda in a way you have not really heard my benediction O Govinda let me repeat it may you walk this path to its end may you find deliverance and of course Govinda realizes that Siddhartha is leaving him and he starts to cry in the middle of page 30 um, Govinda it says in the text tore himself away 
uh, that that imagery of tearing yourself away from someone is it just gives me this this terrible image of like a child being torn from its mother right Siddhartha was Govinda's safe place as long as he was with Siddhartha Govinda was doing good in life now he's taken the impetus to do this new thing and he all of a sudden he realizes he's like wait a minute this Siddhartha's not doing this with me I'm, I don't I don't maybe I didn't realize what I'm doing maybe I didn't realize I was really doing this on my own he tore himself away, embraced the friend of his youth one last time, and joined the procession of novices. Now, we will see Govinda again in this book, but this is a very important part of the narrative. So Siddhartha goes walking, and oh, all of a sudden, he just happens to encounter the Buddha. Siddhartha, however, walked through the grove lost in thought. Siddhartha is now on his own too. Siddhartha may be a little better place to be on his own than Govinda because of the strength of this protagonist's uh, character that we see. But we're going to see what actually happens and how Siddhartha feels about this. He suddenly en encounters Gautama, the sublime one, and when he greets him in awe, the gaze of the Buddha was so full of goodness and stillness, the youth plucked from his courage and he asked the venerable one for permission to speak to him. Silently, the sublime one nodded his consent. And so then uh, Siddhartha says, you know, I was really granting uh, the, uh, the privilege of hearing you, but I'm not staying. I'm going to go. And the, the Buddha says, as you please, you know, to each his own, obviously, right? Um, and then Siddhartha says, but I do want to say something to you before I go. It's kind of itching and scratching at me. On page 31, silently the Buddha nods his consent again to allow um, Siddhartha to speak. And what Siddhartha tells the Buddha, and here they have like this kind of very interesting conversation where Siddhartha is proving himself to be a bit of a prodigy here, right? He's, he's kind of seeing through the teachings, right? He said, I already know what this guy's going to teach me. I've heard it a million times. So he learns something else now that's not indicative of all the teachings. Um, he, t he goes on page 31 to go kind of summary of what the Buddha has taught him. And then Gautama listens and responds. And he says, yes, but the goal that you have differentiated from my teachings is not the goal that I intend. And so in the middle of page 32, in the end of the first full paragraph, the goal is different. My goal is deliverance from suffering. That is what Gotama teaches and nothing else. And then, uh, you know, Siddhartha said, please don't be upset with me. You know, you are the Buddha. You have attained the goal. Um, and the and bottom of that page uh, it came to you from your own seeking, though. Like, the way that you came to enlightenment was your own way. Through knowledge, through illumination, it did not come through a teaching. Nobody taught you this. And this is my thought, O sublime one. No one is granted deliverance through a teaching. You cannot, O venerable one, impart to anyone, tell anyone in words and through teachings what happened to you in the hour of your illumination. The teaching of the illuminated Buddha contains a great deal. It teaches how to live righteously, how to avoid evil. But there's one thing that the so, called, so clear, so venerable teaching does not contain. It does not contain the secret of what the sublime one himself has experienced. He alone among hundreds of thousands. That is what I thought and realized when I heard the teaching. That is why I'm resuming my wandering. Not to seek a different, better teaching. For I know that there is none. But to leave all teachings and all teachers and to reach my goal alone or die. So the image that kind of... Uh, that kind of flashed in me is like imagine two men standing on a beach right in front of the ocean and it's a cloudy day and the sun comes out from the clouds and the sun it reveals itself onto this one man only and it's just like this little section of the clouds that opens the sun happens to be right there and one of this men receives the full warmth and heat of the sun the light of the sun shines upon his face. And you know, when, when we feel the sun's warmth, it kind of envelops us. We feel it front, back, around, top, bottom. It is like a warmth, like a womb experience, right? And then the guy who's standing next to him under the clouds, he's looking at the guy in the sun, and it looks good. Looks great. And the guy can explain, oh my gosh, I feel this, I feel this, I feel this. But it's not going to compare until that sun and those clouds move, and it's now shining on that observer, right? So it's like watching someone stand in full sunlight and hear him explain how warm it feels versus standing in that sunlight yourself. And that's exactly what Siddhartha is saying. He says, you can't teach me because the thing that you want to teach, the thing that is missing, the gap that I have to bridge is this experience that brought you this, no this knowing. 
right? And it's more than knowledge. It's kind of just like a, a sense way deeper than knowledge because knowledge can be taught. Facts can be memorized. But he's talking about a knowing this deep sense of knowing something, like you know who you are inside, like you know you're alive, right? That sense of knowing, we can't, you can't replicate that for us. You can't put that in a bottle and sell it. That's something I have to go find out for my own. Buddha's response, he gazes silently at the ground. Silently, his inscrutable face radiated in perfect equanimity. Um, and he's impressed, right? He continues to kind of teach through this conversation. But I want to bring you down to the bottom of page 33 in, that middle, in the middle of that last paragraph. Um, because uh, the Buddha says, well, what about these other guys that are here? And he's like, I'm not thinking about them. May they all remain with the teaching. May they reach their goal. It's not for me to judge another man's life. I must judge. I must choose. And I tell my students all the time, when you believe something, it's good to know what you believe. Very important because that's how we make really big major life decisions about things. You have to know what you believe. Way more important than what you believe, why you believe it. Because if you cannot justify why you believe something, then you don't believe it. You just memorized it. You were taught it. You think you believe it. But it's the difference between appearance versus reality. I could say, I believe this, I could believe this. But when I go to sleep at night, I might not believe in anything. Do you understand the difference? And that is what Siddhartha is getting to. With half a smile, with an unperturbable brightness, again, this illumination of the Buddha has not gone away. Even in Siddhartha's challenging, the Buddha is enlightened. He, he is untouched. He is separated. He is shining in the story. Let's go to the bottom of page 34, the last paragraph of chapter 3. Buddha has robbed me, thought Siddhartha. He has robbed me, yet he has given me more. He has robbed me of my friend, my friend who believed in me and who now believes in him, my friend who was my shadow and is now Gautama's shadow. But he has given me Siddhartha, has given me myself. And what's really important about this thing is, uh, Siddhartha's really realizing, just as Govinda quickly realized, that he is on his own at this point. Not only is he without a teacher, he is without a friend to travel with, but in this loss, in this loss, he found the simplicity of himself. And in loss, when we lose things, we have to go to basics. We have to find our core. We have to find our legs, essentially, that root in ourselves and say, okay, so what's left? So what do I have left to work with? What do I do with this? And trust me, you can lose everything and you will not lose that core that allows you to keep going and not just surviving, but also thriving. And so this is where Siddhartha finds the silver lining. This is where he finds this amazing happenstance that may lead him to his goal. I'm alone now. So let's go to chapter four, which is the awakening. It's titled Awakening. It's the last chapter of part one before we get into part two. He leaves the grove. He leaves the Buddha. Siddhartha felt that his previous life too was remaining behind in this grove. So not only is he leaving uh, Govinda behind, he's kind of leaving everything he ever knew. For the first time, Siddhartha not only leaves his physical place of, uh, of where he was raised with his family, he didn't really leave too much. Because even though he's traveled for years and he's been separated from that family home for years, he has believed the same things for years. He even had his, a friend of his youth who was from his home with him. Now he's really on his own and now he's like, wow, I have shed a lot of things. I have lost a lot of things. It has gotten so simple that now it's just me. Middle paragraph, he realized he was no longer a youth. He had become a man. So he realizes Govinda's manhood in setting out for himself and making a decision for once on his own. And now he realizes that Siddhartha was also a man and he equals this idea of manhood to the wish to have teachers and hear teachings. That was what his youth was. That was the thing he was shedding as he refers to it. He shed the thing like an old skin that leaves the serpent. That's what he didn't need anymore. I don't need anyone to teach me anymore. Last paragraph on page 35, the ponderer walked more slowly and asked himself. And now we kind of see a first example of him teaching himself, ha having a self-dialogue, <clears throat> that intrapersonal communication, right? Interpersonal communication is you talking to the world. Intrapersonal is inside. It's when I'm talking to myself. Sometimes I just think, sometimes I actually say things out loud. He says it out loud because it's in quotation marks at the bottom of 35. 
just what was it that you wanted to learn from teachings and from teachers and that they have taught you a great deal, could not teach you after all? And he answers himself out loud. It was the ego whose meaning and being I wanted to learn. It was the ego for which I wanted to rid myself, which I wanted to overcome. But I could not overcome it. I could only deceive it. I could flee. I could hide. Truly nothing in the world has occupied my thoughts as much as this ego of mine, this enigmatic fact that I live, that I am one and separated and isolated from all others, that I am Siddhartha. And there is nothing in the world I know less about than myself, than Siddhartha. So this is the thing that no one could teach, right? I like the way Whitman says it in Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. He says, what the teacher could not teach, what the preachers could not preach, right? And what he's talking about in that poem is the soul. The soul of you. That every, and, and Whitman was such a believer in just universal spirituality and just coming to your own enlightenment and revelation, right? Middle of page 36. The reason I was afraid of myself, I was fleeing myself, I was seeking Atman, I was seeking Brahma, I was willing to dismember my ego, peel it apart in order to find the core of all the peels in its un unknown innermost essence to find Atman. But I myself was lost in the process. At the bottom of page 36, I will learn from me, from myself, I will be my own pupil. Just like that little dialogue I just shared with you on the bottom of 35 was. Think of uh, Plato's uh, allegory of the cave. When he's documenting the dialogue between Socrates and his student Glaucon, and he's showing the allegory of the cave through a dialogue between pupil and teacher, and now Siddhartha saying, well, I can do that dialogue by myself, right? That intrapersonal communication. Top of page 37, we see a first visualization, a definition of enlightenment, like I was referring to earlier. He looked around as if seeing the world for the first time. Boom. That's enlightenment. Okay? That's basically a paraphrase of the definition. He is now rediscovering his senses. He is looking around with his senses. Those things which he was killing for years, his desire, his senses, his attraction to things, he is now opened up and even more vulnerable, like, like, hello, baby. You know, let me see everything. So beautiful was the world. Colorful was the world. Bizarre and enigmatic was the world. There was blue. There was yellow. There was green. The sky flowed. River, forest, jutted, mountain. Everything beautiful. He's really taking in everything that his eyes can see. Um, meaning and reality were not somewhere beyond things. They were in them. So meaning and reality are in everything is what the bottom of that paragraph writes. He, pre he says now in the bottom of the second full paragraph, I called the world of appearances deception. Now we're going to get back to this because when a character says something like this, says something like out loud, like I used to think this and now I think different, that kind of thing always circles back. So we're going to come back to that. Called my eyes and my tongue random and worthless. Okay. Using the senses, the vision, the taste. He wants to taste the world again. He wants to see things again. He wants to feel things again. He doesn't feel like he learned anything from asceticism. So we kind of are foreshadowed now and to say, uh-oh, is he going to go the opposite end of the spectrum? Is the pendulum now swinging in the other way? The past, I have awakened. I am truly awake. And today is the day of my birth. He's literally like saying, I'm reborn. And while thinking these thoughts, Siddhartha halted again as if a serpent were lying in his path. On page 38, we see that again. He halted as if a serpent were lying in his path. When we see serpents, we think of foreshadowing. foreshadowing we think of the symbolism of deception, of lies, of trickery. For years he had been homeless, had not felt it, but now he felt it always. Even in the most faraway meditation, he had been his father's son. No one was so alone as he. He feels alone now because before he served something higher. He suffered and sacrificed, but it was for a greater good. Now... He only serves himself. So how alone is he to only serve himself, right? On page 39, the last page of our chapter review for today, from that moment of coldness and despondence, Siddhartha surfaced more ego than before, more concentrated. He felt that this had been the final shudder of awakening, the last cramp of birth, and instantly he started walking again, started walking swiftly and impatiently, no longer to his home, no longer to his father, no longer back. And when we have a character who is so definitively moving forward and we know that he is not slow uh, to, uh, to move, he is quick. I cannot wait to see what happens as we see the next level of this awakening unfold.